Thank you. Um, so my name is Linda Shack, everybody. I'm a consultant with the Emergency Nutrition Network and currently the facilitator of the IFP core group. I'm very happy to be joining you for this really exciting sharing and learning cafe. It's really the third and the last of a series of cafes that we've been implementing in 2021. Today's Sharing and Learning Cafe is brought to you through a joint initiative between the IFP Core Group and the Nutrition Information System, a global thematic working group, part of the Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance, as well as, of course, UNICEF, WHO, CDC, and the SMART Initiative. Next, please. A reminder of the uh, working group, the webinar working group members, uh, thanks to their support, we're able to implement these uh, webinars. And of course, we're grateful to the generous support of our donors, including USAID, Irish Aid, and uh, UNICEF. Next, please. So today's sharing and learning at cafe, again, um, as for all the sharing and learning cafes, it is really a space uh, for us to share um, lessons learned and information. And for today, the objective is really for us um, to disseminate the findings and recommendations of the IYCFE assessment mapping exercise. Also uh, to raise awareness and um, really discuss the updated WHO UNICEF IYCF indicators in the context of emergencies and discuss opportunities, challenges, and best practices for using these indicators in emergency contexts. As mentioned, this is a joint initiative between the IFP core group, the NIS working group, UNICEF WHO, CDC, and the SMART initiative. Next, please. So um, as we are starting with a brief introduction, uh, we will then hand over and listen to a, an exciting presentation on a mapping of IYCFE assessment methodologies. We will then uh, move to a very exciting panel discussion um, to discuss the IYCF indicators, then move to a Q&A uh, to which we encourage you to really positively engage, and then a closing. I'd like to remind you uh, to please add your questions to the Q&A um, box and any comments in the chat box. Next, please. Uh, so today's facilitators and presenters, we do have a panel and uh, we will introduce the panel, of course, uh, in a bit. But just to see uh, here, I've already introduced myself. Uh, also colleagues from ACF, Hassan Ali Ahmad, Associate Director of Nutrition and Lead for Smart Initiative. Jana Daher, we'll hear from her in a bit. Uh, Ms. Fatmata Fatima Sase, Nutrition Specialist from UNICEF and Alessandra Yalamo uh, from FHI 360 and Deborah Wilson from WFB. Thanks in advance for your support, as well as the support of the interpreters and the other IFP core group webinar member uh, working groups. Um, and now, without further ado, I am happy to introduce to you uh, Jenna Daher, who is a SMART Project Manager, Research, Innovation, and Technology from Action Against Hunger Canada. And Jana will start with a presentation on the mapping of current practices related to the IYCF assessment methodology in humanitarian and fragile environments. Uh, the floor is yours, Jana. Thank you, Lindia. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jana, and I am going to present, as Linda mentioned, the outcome of an IYCF uh, assessment uh, mapping exercise that was conducted earlier this year between February and March. Next, please. Um, the overall objective of the uh, exercise was to map the current IYCF uh, assessment methodology practices that we have in humanitarian and fragile environments and specifically focusing on uh, identifying the different methodologies used, the tools, the ways of dissemination, the challenges and the indicators that are used in these assessments, but also to understand the representativeness of uh, these IYCF assessments in terms of uh, sampling methodologies. And finally, of course, to analyze the data and provide recommendations to the Global Nutrition uh, Information System Working Group and the um, Infant Feeding and Emergency Core Group. Next, please. 
So for the methodology, uh, we had an online survey that was developed with a list of questions uh, that we reviewed and it was validated by uh, the NIS working group and uh, the IFE core group. Next, please. So this exercise targeted both uh, country level and global level uh, stakeholders. So at country level, um, nutrition clusters and sector partners, specifically the NIS and IYCF technical working group members were considered and at the global level, uh, the IFE and the GNC members were targeted. Next, please. So in terms of the results, we're not gonna dig deep here. So we're just gonna have an overview of the results. Uh, in total, we received 146 responses and uh, 88 of which uh, they had uh, previously implemented an IYCF assessment. Uh, these 88 responses, they came from a diverse list of countries. We have 26 different countries and uh, with most responses coming from Yemen and Somalia. And the majority of responders were affiliated to um, INGOs and interestingly local NGOs and UN agencies uh, with only three submissions. I had to say this, uh, we're a bit disappointed with the three submissions, only three submissions coming from uh, government agencies. Next, please. So in terms of the type of assessments used uh, to collect IYCF information, it was found that um, the majority were integrated assessments uh, like SMART and food security assessments. Um, with a small number, only a small number of standalone IYCF assessments. And when we focus on integrated assessments, uh, IYCF data was mostly integrated into health, nutrition, and WASH assessments in that order. Next, please. So partner reported using um, 15 different methodologies to collect IYCF data. That was a surprising kind of outcome of this exercise. 15 is a lot, uh, with the top three uh, being CAP, uh, the qualitative assessments, uh, such as the focus group discussions, and uh, SMART methodologies, so SMART surveys. Next, please. Uh, partners also reported the inclusion of both core and optional indicators for IYCF, but let's note here that at the time of this exercise, the new WHO indicators were not yet released, um, hence you're seeing a separation of core and optional indicators here. But overall, uh, breastfeeding indicators were the most commonly included in surveys, uh, followed by the introduction to solid, semi-solid, and soft foods. Next, please. Um, UNICEF and WHO were reported to be uh, the main sources of reference for IYCF indicators uh, used in the assessments, and they guided the development of the questionnaires. But um, despite having the global reference, it was uh, interesting to note that a number of partners uh, still reported uh, to have formulated their own questions. And potentially, potentially this is to align to their um, respective programs and organizational priorities. Next, please. So the survey findings also showed that uh, partners mainly use Excel and the ENA software that we have in SMART uh, for sample size calculation. Uh, in addition, there was a varied approach for these calculations and the parameters used. So everyone used different types uh, of parameters and types of calculations. And we also noted that in some cases, non-IYCF parameters such as GAM prevalence were used in the sample size calculation. And this, from an epidemiology point of view, it limits the representativeness of the IYCF related results. Uh, but this, this was not very um, shocking after seeing that a lot of the users um, or a lot of the responders were using the ENA software, which uh, provides this type of uh, sample size calculation. Next, please. 
So in terms of the uh, data collection tools, uh, half of the assessments were reported to be conducted using paper-based questionnaires. So this is, of course, very manual. Uh, and we all know that this approach introduces a lot of risks. Uh, in uh, human errors, but also makes the surveys usually very cumbersome. Next, please. So IYCF assessments were also reported to be mainly uh, used. This is for like uh, in terms of how they're being used. They're used to um, uh, for program purposes specifically to establish like a baseline, uh, evaluate the outcome of a project, and to inform proposal writing. Um, but on the other hand, IYCF data is still not being very optimally uh, used to inform the HNO, HRP processes, uh, which may be attributed, we don't know, but we may be, may be attributed to the lack of standard uh, thresholds to interpret the severity of IYCF results. Next, please. So in terms of the challenges, um, a number was identified. We, we put a few on this slide, and they're mostly related to the lack of uh, standardization and harmonization of methods for IYCF assessments. Uh, but also the lack of globally recognized thresholds uh, for uh, indicators. Um, and in fact, the continued integ integration of uh, IYCF indicators and other assessments was still identified as a challenge in terms of getting representative results. Next, please. So coming to the recommendation section, and this is um, just to note that we have a, a long list and we are providing two on this uh, slide. But in terms of the methodology and the sample size calculation, um, it would be important for WHO and UNICEF and other global uh, stakeholders to review and recommend a limited number of methodologies specifically for subnational IYCF assessments, um, like as preferred methodologies for the emergencies and humanitarian contexts. And uh, for us, the SMART team, to consider facilitating the integration of an IYCF, standardized IYCF module in uh, the new SMART Plus software that we're working on uh, that could be used when the IYCF assessment are both done either independently or as a standalone or as part of SMART surveys. In terms of the recommendation number two, and for the threshold, IYCF threshold generally do not, are not very much available, but the GMC did um, work on the humanitarian needs analysis tool and they developed it and that provides a, an opportunity to, to, rec to recommend this kind of consensus driven uh, threshold. So um, for specifically the recommendation for threshold, we do recommend to use them as an interim. Uh, and review the progress and, their ex and the experience of utilizing those uh, thresholds when conducting IYCF assessments. Next, please. Uh, finally, on behalf of uh, ACF Canada, the SMART team, uh, I want to acknowledge and thank the following partners who made this mapping exercise possible. Uh, Save the Children, uh, GNCTA, INS, uh, NIS working group, the IFE core group, and all the colleagues that kindly responded to our survey. Thanks a lot. I think uh, I'll give it back to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Jana, for your excellent overview of the IYCFE assessment mapping exercise. I am sure there will be a lot of questions uh, for Jenna to respond to. So please put your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A. Colleagues, I am pleased to introduce our panelists for today's moderated session on the new UNICEF WHO IYCF indicators. Colleagues, in no particular order, I have uh, Lawrence uh, Grumerstrong, who is the unit head of the food and nutrition actions in the health in health systems at WHO? 
He coordinates WHO's work on infant and young child nutrition, treatment of acute malnutrition, and the prevention of micronutrient deficiencies. Until December 2014, Larry has served as the Chief of Nutrition Branch at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, where he worked for over 23 years in reproductive health and nutrition. Larry has earned his PhD from Princeton University, and he is an epidemiologist who has authored over 180 scientific publications. He is also a key author of the UNICEF the BHO IYCF indicators. With us today also is Brenda Mera, who is a physician and a public health professional with expertise in data analysis and monitoring of child nutrition. Brenda is a statistics specialist with the division of data analytics, planning and monitoring at UNICEF. And Brenda has led the development, expansion, and maintenance of UNICEF's global databases on infant and young child feeding and contributed to the methodological work in this area, including the updated guidance on IYCF indicators. Before UNICEF, Brenda worked with academic universities where she supported the evaluation of maternal newborn child health and nutrition project and publish several papers. Also with us today, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Oleg Buleka, who is an Associate Director for Science at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he has worked since 2000. His advanced expertise includes international nutrition, statistics, epidemiologies, surveys and surveillance, among other topics. Colleagues, Dr. Oleg has published over 40 peer-reviewed papers and reviewed over 20 scientific journals, including The Lancet, The JAMA, and The BMJ. He is a world expert on nutrition assessment methods in emergencies and post-emergencies, as well as an active member of the Global Nutrition in Emergencies Working Group, where he regularly advises uh, senior nutrition technical staff on major international and UN agencies uh, to activate uh, the nutrition sector. Colleagues, it is a great pleasure to have you with us today. Over to you, Linda and colleagues. A pleasure indeed. Thank you so much, Fatmata. And now I think um, it's time for us to engage with um, our panelists. Um, to give you an idea, we actually prepared a few questions and uh, themes around um, the IYCF indicators, um, the recently revised IYCF um, indicators. And the first question that I'd like to ask to our panelists um, relate to the prioritization of indicators, and um, Jana had alluded to some of that. Um, and the question goes is um, that there is a consensus and there's agreement that the new indicators are important um, to assess in order to provide appropriate and effective IYCF programming. We also understand the rationale for each of the indicators and guidance for calculating the indicators is understandable. However, um, especially given that there are no longer core and optional indicators, the difficulty is really in how to prioritize these indicators especially when there are scarce resources, when there are donor requirements um, and multi-sectoral projects that do not allow for the use of all the indicators. Specifically in emergencies, um, nutrition may be a small component of a larger response. And again, we saw some examples from Jana's presentation. However, IYCF surveys may be more intensive and may require more resources. Therefore, uh, we have a few um, specific questions. Uh, which indicators would you say um, should be a priority to integrate um, in, for example, smart surveys? Um, how can we integrate these new indicators into multi-sector surveys? 
what would be priority indicators for different contexts, including conflict, conflict settings, and which ones would be priority to integrate if it's not feasible to integrate all. So it's really around um, using these indicators and prioritizing them for different um, surveys and contexts. Um, therefore, I um, address this question to all three of our panelists. And um, may I first maybe ask uh, Brenda to, uh, to address um, this question? Sure. Thanks, Linda. And hello, everyone. Um, yes. It's true that we have no longer got the distinction between core and optional indicators, but essentially uh, I would take the first question around which indicators would be a priority to integrate in, for example, the smart surveys. So for our global databases, we review a lot of different data sources, including smart surveys, and our review has indicated that increasingly smart surveys have been including the standardized questionnaire that was published in the 2008 indicator guidance document, which was the earlier version of this updated indicator guidance document. And although the number of questions in this updated version has increased from this 2008 version, the new, in, the new questions basically are needed for the calculation of two new indicators on unhealthy eating practices, which is sweet beverage consumption and unhealthy food consumption. All the other 15 indicators that are recommended in this updated guidance can actually be calculated based on questions that have already been used in survey programs for a long time. So for example, to put all of this in context, initially percentage of children ever breastfed was an optional indicator. So although it was an optional indicator, that question has always been asked in IYCF surveys because it is needed to determine the percentage who are uh, put to the breast within the first hour of life, which is early initiation of breastfeeding. So it does not really require asking of a new question or an additional question that has been there. I think I would stop at least for now on the first question and see if others have anything to input. Thank you, Brenda. May I ask Larry to see if uh, would you would like to input on this question? Sure, Linda, thank you very much. And uh, good, good to be with you all today. Um, so I would definitely echo what Brenda said, that the, uh, the, the new indicators really aren't that much greater than they were before. Um, the number of indicators is greater, um, but the actual data collection is not that different than it was before. And that actually reflects some of what we, some of the reason why we moved away from having core and optional indicators. Um, it gave the impression that these optional indicators were less important, and yet they actually weren't any harder to collect. And we said, you know, if, if you're already collecting the data, why wouldn't you look at the data in multiple ways? And so most of this proliferation of additional indicators um, does not reflect any new data collection, except uh, as Renda said, on the, the sugar sweetened beverages and uh, unhealthy foods. Um, so if you were able to do it before, there's really no reason that you couldn't, couldn't still do most of these indicators. Um, but I do think that it, it still, still raises a valid question with the complexities that we have in emergency settings. Is it possible to get adequate sample size and a, a full questionnaire of doing all of this? So what would we need to give up? Um, in fact, as, as we saw in the presentation that we just uh, had a few minutes ago, that meaning of core and optional um, doesn't actually reflect what is done in the field. Some of the optional indicators were more often reflected than many of the core indicators. Um, so people were, were kind of prioritizing on the basis of what was of interest to them, not in the core versus uh, uh, optional anyway. Um, so I, we're left with, so what, what would you do if you had to cut back? If it really is just a matter of this is too long a questionnaire, we can't go through it. Um, I think it's helpful to start thinking about you know well, what's possible uh, uh, to, to cut away. Um, and the problem that we run into is that you're going to have difficulty with comparability to standard indicators that might be reflected at the national level if you want to compare to a, a previous national survey or to another setting. Um, any real change, any substantive change to the questionnaire is going to hurt that comparability. That's a downside, but on the other hand, it also can give you some flexibility in saying, yes, but for our setting, we need different data. We need to be a little bit more targeted in what we're looking, looking at and what we're going to do with those data. 
Um, so I would look, rather than at what indicators can I drop, I would look at what data is least uh, uh, least interest in my context if I have to cut back. And I think the, the first place I would start is on the long list of foods. Um, we have many different foods listed there because of the need to get at dietary diversity. Um, we want to look at eight different kinds of foods there. We want to make sure that we're capturing those. Um, so I would say you may just have to give up if you can't get the, the, the probing, give up on some of that um, dietary diversity overall and focus in on some key categories of foods that are most important in, in the population. Um, if, you, if you can't do all of it, then I would say I would probably be focusing first on egg and flesh foods. The animal source foods are such a key important uh, ingredient for or a component um, for micronutrients. Um, and that is often what is the, the rate limiting uh, food uh, to, to, to keep those from being met. And secondly, fruits and vegetables. Um, so if you had to cut back, that's where I'd say the most questions that you could get without losing most of the indicators. Um, would be in that area. So I would start to, with some of that. Um, the liquids, I think you probably could be um, categorized a little bit more in groups than they are. We would do more probing on different kinds of liquids, but they probably could be um, broken down into to, to smaller sets. Ultimately, I think the most important um, uh, indicators um, or, or way of looking at the data um, for emergency settings would actually be the area graphs that we create for children less than six months of age or infants less than six months. Um, and for that, you need to say, are they exclusively breastfed? But if they're not, what is going on? Is it water? Is it other liquids that they're being given? Is it breast milk substitutes? Is it solids? Um, because those are really what's going to drive your programmatic, where, am I, where, where do I need to intervene that I, that I need to make a change? Um, as you look longer, longer term at the complementary feeding, really I would focus in on the animal source foods and the, the fruits and vegetables. Of course, any, any cutback, you're going to be giving up on something. It's always hard when, it, when you say prioritize, you know, oh, we don't care about junk foods. Well, still we, sure can, should we, we still care, but if you have to give up on something, that would be an area that I would be giving up on. I'll stop with that. Thanks so much, Larry. This is really useful. Um, I'd like to also ask Oleg if you would like to also um, reflect on that question, specifically maybe the first bit on uh, smart surveys and priority indicators. Uh, Dr. Oleg, I think you are on mute. If you could please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, and thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar, and greetings to all the participants. So uh, yes, uh, in smart surveys, obviously, we are trying to keep the number of questions and the time of the interview to a minimum. So uh, sometime uh, we, we would actually encourage to uh, choose the questions on IYCF that are most programmatically important. And uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, probably the most time consuming part of the IYCF questionnaire would be a probing on different types of foods and liquids, uh, both to assess dietary diversity and also to uh, assess the, you know this question on uh, on infant feeding area graphs, uh, basically you know, uh, non milk liquids, milk liquids, breast milk, etc. So uh, uh, definitely uh, we encourage to uh, make the questionnaires uh, setting specific. I would agree that administering the full questionnaire versus administering part of the questionnaire probably would not make much of a difference, but it may maybe kind of, you know, five minutes plus five minutes minus. But definitely uh, unhealthy food consumption, uh, snacks, uh, sugar or beverages may be less important in in very low resource setting, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa where we have refugees, displaced people, some questions definitely may seem out of context. 
on the other hand, uh, in some other refugee populations, for example, like Syrian refugees living in, in, uh, in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon, uh, definitely actually an unhealthy food consumption is an issue. And uh, in those populations, actually, we may see more overweight than, than underweight, than wasting. So, so depending on the population, we can uh, definitely choose and discuss uh, with the colleagues uh, what specific indicators uh, are most relevant to specific situations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to my colleague Hassan for the next question. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, so maybe uh, uh, follow up questions to Dr. Oleg. Um, are there ongoing efforts by this SMART initiative or other groups, WHO, UNICEF, uh, other UN agencies, to pilot rapid assessment methods uh, of the new indicators that could be accepted by the international uh, community? Uh, thank you. I'm not aware of new rapid assessment methodologies that are being proposed beyond what we already have. That this, I think these uh, questions are really meant for use in population representative surveys. Because uh, like the way these questions are posed, they are intended to generate a population representative prevalences of different behaviors, different uh, uh, types of food intake, et cetera. So, so, and I mean, you know, rapid assessment is a little bit misleading because some people call smart surveys rapid assessments. Uh, as as a, a colleagues mentioned, uh, the question of sample size is also an issue. So. So we are looking forward maybe to discussing more in detail in this webinar what, uh, what minimum sample size colleagues are thinking of when they are thinking of, of generating the prevalences. And uh, actually what would also be interesting to discuss, we see these IYCF indicators uh, used in many surveys, but unfortunately, so far we have very little to no information on the design effect, whether these behaviors are clustered or these behaviors are fairly uniformly distributed in the populations of interest. And, and that would also inform a little bit uh, like how big the sample size we need uh, to generate stable, relatively stable prevalences for each of these indicators. Uh, so my short answer is these indicators are mostly for representative population surveys. And uh, obviously they are widely used in mix and DHS surveys. Sample sizes in those surveys are huge and they're absolutely sufficient. Uh, use of these indicators in smart surveys is more challenging because obviously effective sample sizes for different smaller age group windows in which we are assessing each of these indicators uh, present some challenges to attaining sufficient sample, uh, sample size. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. I'm gonna hand over to Fatmata. Thank you so much, Gemma and colleagues. I am going to circle back to Larry and uh, ask uh, this question. Larry, I know you touched on this uh, briefly uh, during your earlier presentation, but uh, this is a question that has been coming up uh, a number of times uh, from colleagues uh, from the field. Because of the narrow age ranges required for the de denominators of some of the indicators, as example for caregivers uh, zero to five months, the sample size needed for a statistically significant result for the survey becomes quite unwieldy. 
and such a large sample will tie up scarce resources during uh, personnel, including personnel that will otherwise be put forward towards uh, essential uh, services. So donors require baseline and inline uh, prevalence, even in short emergency projects, but are typically unwilling to fund such intensive surveys. Already, this is a challenge uh, that existed uh, with the previous indicators. So, Larry, I'm going to ask you <laughs> to provide us some um, of your thoughts around how we can balance meeting the needs and measuring the needs and uh, also whether we could use purposive sampling um, to consider the breakdown suggested or even area age ranges that will have a uh, low meaning example two to three, three months. Uh, Larry, uh, this <laughs> is for you, but I'm also going to open it, open it up after your feedback if uh, uh, any of our colleagues, uh, Brenda or Dr. Oleg will have uh, additional points to make. Larry, over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Fatmata. Um, there's there's so many issues packed into this question. Uh, sampling mm -hmm. isn't just a matter of how to get, can we get a sample, but it, it, it brings in so many other issues. Um, I, I think that the main reason that we uh, have, have framed this around household surveys is that we want representative data. We want to be able to statistically take the results of our survey and say this applies to the entire population. Um, and to do that, we have to have a way of basically knowing what the universe is to, to draw from. We do household surveys because it's fairly easy to define the universe of households. We know where there are structures, where we can go and, and talk to people um, and collect data. Um, but it's not the only way. It seems to be the most efficient way for national surveys, but is it necessarily the, the, the best in emergency settings? I do think we have to look at how those settings are set up. If we can find alternative ways to, uh, to find children less than two years of age and be representative, that probably is optimal. It would make it much easier to, to do the survey and get right to the population that we want to ask these questions of rather than spending so much time knocking on doors, going through lots of screening questions to, to get down to that. Um, so if there are other ways that I think it is perfectly legitimate to do a more purposive sampling on the basis of that kind of universe. So, you know, are there registries of the, the people living in a refugee camp um, and you know where those, those children are? Are there um, surveys of where, where births have occurred over a certain period of time and you know where those are occurring? I think in most situations those don't exist, but if they do exist, then you certainly can get representative data. Um, I think what then happens is if you don't have a way of doing that, if there's no way to do a household survey, it's just too costly um, to get an adequate sample size, and you don't have another way of finding these, uh, these uh, children, um, then you're going to have to go to something that is not representative. Um, and the result is that you won't be able to generalize this is the number for this population at this point in time. That doesn't mean it's useless. What you have to do is you really need to think about what is the, why are you collecting these data? Um, and if, you, if, you, if it's really to get a background that you want to use this for planning your, uh, you know, how, how should I be providing services? Is this a population that has very high rates of breastfeeding or low rates of breastfeeding? Um, a purposive non-representative sample is probably good enough. Um, if you're trying to um, evaluate, are your interventions actually having an impact? And are, you, are there certain areas that we should be focusing our attention on? Again, you might be able to work with a different population, maybe those who are coming in to a clinic um, or are appearing for screening for other purposes um, might be a, a reasonable sample to work from. Um, it's not going to necessarily represent the population, you can't generalize, but it still gives you enough information that you can say, look, I can use this for evaluating, is my program doing what it's supposed to be doing? Are you trying to be doing trends for a comparison to what the population was prior to the emergency to after? Um, those become much more difficult because you have to really be comparable in your methodology. Um, what I would say is that if you expect this is going to be a situation where you're going to want to do the survey multiple times, as you put in here, a baseline and an end line, if there's an expectation that the emergency may be lasting over some time and you're going to want to do this periodically, make sure you come up with a methodology in which you are sampling in a consistent way. It may not be representative, but you may say, look, I'm, I'm going to do this in the people who come to the clinic for vaccination. Um, use that consistently over time because you will not be able to, to compare 
a sample from a vaccination survey in one place um, and another that was based on uh, uh, an existing household survey that you, you, you tagged on to. Mixing methodologies is going to, to really make a mess of interpretation uh, of your results. Um, what I would say um, is that uh, you really need to also think about the time frame of, of what, what, what data you're looking for, um, because while we, while we do these surveys as what's going on at this point in time, we do have to recognize that infant feeding is something that changes over time and is a reflection of what has happened in the past. So if you're coming into an emergency and let's say you're two weeks in and you want to get this assessment, your assessment of is breastfeeding continuing in the second year of life primarily is going to be a reflection of what was happening long before the emergency started. You can't say that no one's breastfeeding now because of the emergency. It may be that they had stopped breastfeeding long before. Um, similarly, exclusive breastfeeding isn't just what's happening today. It's a reflection of, did they start introducing complementary foods earlier? Did they start using water? Um, while families can go back to more exclusive breastfeeding, in general, they don't. In general, it's a progression toward more and more, um, basically, insults, if you want to say, count it that way, to exclusive breastfeeding. Um, and so if you're already six months into the emergency, then yes, it's reflective of what's happening during the, the time of that emergency. Um, but if, you're, uh, if, if you have a much longer time, time frame of, in which those, those behaviors were occurring, um, don't, don't expect that, that it's going to be relevant. Um, and therefore the sampling and which indicators you would focus on are going to be dependent on uh, what, 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 what's the purpose of it and what kind of uh, time frame you're working from. I'll stop with that for the moment. Thank you so much, Larry. This is so insightful. I take your point about alternative ways of reaching children under two years of age, and also looking at registries, births, and ensuring uh, data is uh, representative where possible, but we can also use purposive sampling, but ensuring the consistency of sampling. This uh, really important uh, take home points for me. But uh, Brenda, uh, do you have any additional uh, points to make on this question? Uh, thanks, Patmatan. Uh, just one additional point adding on and echoing what Larry just said. I think another way to tackle the small sample sizes that we have for a number of these IYCF indicators is really to have that room of negotiation with donors that you choose at that time indicators probably with larger sample size because emergency context, usually they are short-term projects like you mentioned. So it probably makes more sense to maybe select continued breastfeeding or diet indicators like minimum diet diversity, where the sample size is already large enough so that you're able to see some change within a short period of time. Because like we said, the recommended frequency of doing these IYCF surveys is three to five years, and we don't expect changes that frequently to happen. So also, again, echoing the fact that it ultimately boils down to what the program is trying to change in a short period of time and then selecting those indicators and then sampling populations based on that. Over. Thank you so much, Brenda. That's indeed very helpful. So I'm going to hand back to Hassan and Linda for the next set of questions. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you very much, Fatmata. Um, so I'm just going to follow up this question to Brenda. Um, and so the list of typical foods and beverages uh, consumed by IOCF needs to be adapted to each context. Uh, this may require harmonization between actors conducting such type of surveys in a given country to allow robust comparison. Uh, the RICF working groups may help in some countries. However, uh, visual tools may also be required for field data collection. Uh, are there plans to develop job aid for the indicator guidance? Um, for example, to guide the field enumerators uh, or, and do you think this is something that would be useful? Thank you. No, I definitely feel that it is very useful to adapt the beverage and food list and really use visual tools to support data collection, especially when it comes to categorizing the different food items into the different food categories. Uh, 
However, we do not currently have plans to develop job aids specifically, but the guidance document has a section on selecting and training interviewers, which provides examples of undertaking interactive exercises with the interviewers where they are giving some item cards or images with pictures of food items on it, and then they have to sort it and categorize it correctly into the proper food groups. So you could undertake the interactive exercises, do, do role playing, classroom practice, field practice with the data collectors just to build on their skills. And it is also helpful if the uh, if the enumerators are actually trained in nutrition or they have had some background previously in conducting these nutrition surveys. But I would also like to say that in the absence of these job aids or visual aids, there are currently efforts underway just to circle back to adaptation of the liquid and food list, which is currently happening. So at UNICEF, for the UNICEF conducted mixed surveys, we actually provide inputs to the adaptation of the food and the liquid list at the survey design phase when the questionnaires are sent to our sector specialists for review. And additionally, we also know of a project with USAID Advancing Nutrition and the Global Diet Quality Project, which is trying to build a repository of sentinel food groups that are consumed by majority of women and young children across different countries and in different country contexts. So the idea of this particular project is that there would be a standardized list or adapted food list for different countries, which would be available on a publicly available website and survey programs can actually take that list into future surveys to allow for some harmonization. So I'll stop here for that. Thank you very much, Linda, for that. Um, back to you, Linda. Thank you, Hassan. And uh, maybe just to ask whether Dr. Oleg or uh, Larry have any additional input on the previous um, question. Please feel free to. Uh, yeah, that's all I like. I just, uh, from the from Rinda's uh, actual response, I got an interesting idea because when uh, the preparation is done for mixed for DHS, it's quite a serious, systematic preparation. And, uh, and if they go through this exercise to list the foods and to validate the local foods, actually this may then be a useful starting point for the smart surveys done in the same country. I'm not saying that these lists should be used as, as they are for displaced uh, populations in all the contexts, but actually making these like adapted standard food lists that are, are done uh, when mix or DHS is done, making them available then to the agencies that uh, are doing IYCF in smart surveys could be a useful starting point and would probably help them to, uh, you know, to collect data in a more or less kind of standard way so that it's comparable among surveys are conducted by different agencies. Over. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Maybe I'll just add, add one very brief comment uh, to just to build on what Vrinda was talking of there about the, the adaptation using the uh, dietary quality um, data. Um, we were both on a call just last night about some of those data. It was a broader call, but, but we were talking about some of that. Um, and they pointed out that really a list of only like five or six foods within each of the, the lines on the survey um, seemed to capture about 95% of the consumption that was there. So the need, um, it, it needs to be done by country, but we're using the data that uh, Brenda was just talking about, um, they really were finding that you don't have to do a whole lot more probing to capture every food and all of the, the different nuances that are there. Um, yes, there will be some error, you will miss some things, but it seemed to be a very small number that might be missed. Obviously, that could be a little bit different in displaced populations if, if the diet is being skewed. But my guess is that in, in general, the dietary diversity and what's available in those settings is reduced, not increased. 
Um, and so you're probably going to be doing even doing even better. Not in every circumstance, there might be some, some special nuances to the diet, um, but in general, once those data are publicly available, and it sounds like it would be quite soon, um, it could make that ad adaptation process much easier. Wonderful. Thank you. This is really uh, very useful. And hopefully uh, we'll hear from you also on, on that uh, bit, some, some updates as they are out. Thank you. Um, I'll circle back to uh, Vrinda, uh, if it's okay, to also ask a specific question related to threshold. And I think I saw a question even in the Q&A on that. Um, we know that within the sphere standards that there are um, thresholds for acute malnutrition indicators um, we don't have for IYCF. And um, so are there thresholds that you would recommend to use in emergency context? and? Uh, what would indi what indicators would the thresholds refer to? Thanks, Linda. So for the emergency context, I'm not sure if thresholds need to be different from the regular context. So definitely for IYCF and specifically within the IYCF domain of indicators, we do have the Global World Health Assembly targets for exclusive breastfeeding for the year 2025 and 2030, which is to achieve at least 50% exclusive breastfeeding by the year 2025 and 70% by 2030. And this global target may be adapted as thresholds even within the emergency context. Uh, for now, this is the only target that's available, but I think in terms of additional indicators, something around minimum diet diversity would also be helpful. Uh, at UNICEF, at least we have started looking into the data and coming up with the various cutoffs and thresholds that would make sense, but that's still work in progress. So I'll stop here for that. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, Linda, any additional I, input? I... Yes. Yes. Could, could, I add a, could I add a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that unlike many other of the indicators in Sphere, um, this is one where you it really doesn't make sense to have a global threshold. I mean, while, while Vrinda is right that we do have a, a global target of, of what we'd like to achieve on exclusive breastfeeding, um, when you look at the country level and what's appropriate for that country and what can be done in a short time frame, um, for some, it doesn't make sense to talk about 50% because they've already got 70% exclusive breastfeeding. You certainly wouldn't want your target to, to, to be to reduce that. Um, and other countries are at 10%. Um, it is just completely impossible to, to, to expect that um, you're going to achieve that in a short, I shouldn't say, it, it's not impossible, but it's difficult in a short time frame. And I'd say certainly in an, ex, in an emergency situation, particularly difficult. To me, the most valuable threshold would be what has been happening in that population prior to the emergency. And you don't want to fall below that. Don't let the emergency cause your IYCF to worsen. Um, so if there are pre-existing data from the country or from a nearby country that you think is in a comparable situation, that's where I would be starting my threshold, ideally to, to make some progress on that. Um, but you know, that, that, given how wide these, these range from country to country, like I say, 10% to 80% we get on, on exclusive breastfeeding. I, I don't remember on the minimum dietary diversity, but likewise, huge ranges, um, rather than a single number, base it, base it on something that is much more locally relevant. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Oleg, would you like to add anything on that? Well, oh. I absolutely agree uh, that, for example, in uh, in the U.S., breastfeeding may be low, but for example, dietary diversity and meal frequency may be absolutely adequate, whereas in some other countries it may be the other way around. So applying the same threshold to different population doesn't really make much sense. Because you know, it's it's really the trend that we are looking for. And for that, like baseline data, previous data yeah. is very important. What, what did this population look like a year ago or in stable situation? And what changes we are, we are seeing now? Do we see deterioration because of the emergency or do we see improvement because of our great programs? So I would definitely agree with Larry on that. Thank you. Um, so I, I also see in the Q&A um, questions about thresholds for um, the complementary feeding indicators. Um, and we heard about that from um, Brenda and you and Larry. Also the importance of, as you're all saying, um, 
to compare, to look at trend, to, to look at change before and after, um, which makes it even more important to, to have data prior to an emergency and uh, be prepared um, for that. So all very valuable. Um, thank you so much. I, I think I'm now going to hand over to Fatmata for a closing question before we go to the Q&A because a number of questions are also uh, there from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Indeed, there yeah, are a number of questions. So uh, this will be a closing question for the panel, and uh, then we will go to the questions from our participants. So our colleagues, uh, Larry, Brenda, and Dr. Oleg, um, are there any additional actions, efforts that uh, UNICEF, WHO, and CDC, and the Nutrition Information System Technical Working Group are planning to support in the adaptation of these indicators in emergency and fragile contexts. So perhaps I will start with Dr. Oleg and then to Larry and then Brenda. Thank you. So uh, several points here. First, uh, these indicators are standardized indicators so we want as much as possible that these questions are asked in the same way in different surveys so that we get comparable data because if this like the you know the questions are rephrased or or uh, you know changed then uh, people may be uh, producing or generating these indicators, by, but the prevalence would not mean the same thing as the prevalence in other surveys. So, so the first point is to standardize as much as possible what questions are used across all platforms, makes DHS smart. Uh, in the new software that we are updating for smart, we are, we are planning to have these uh, question banks and uh, and obviously, if we have standard questions that people can pick and choose and drop into their surveys and they are already available in the question bank, that would really facilitate standardization so that people don't invent, like you know, if you know, their own questions, they use standard question from the bank and it's very handy and easy. Uh, and obviously, second is translation how these questions are translated, what is the quality of translation to make sure that we uh, preserve the meaning. And, and also obviously not all of the questions, but many of the questions, they need special uh, training and role playing basically. It doesn't just you know, take like 10 minutes you know, in the training to just say, okay, let's read you know, through the questions. Do you have any, any questions you know, how to ask them? Kind of, you know, really, I think kind of the probing for specific foods, uh, kind of understanding what the local foods are, et cetera. We need to make sure that if we really endeavor to measure these indicators in, for example, smart surveys, that sufficient time is spent on training interviewers how to properly ask these questions and not just run through these questions, assuming that kind of, you know, interviewers will be doing a good job. And in terms of like additional actions and efforts, I think that as we build the databases of surveys and as uh, we have like if the, what we have like the data aggregator and and agencies will be sharing uh, with the central database uh, their data sets. I think we will start uh, doing some research and looking, you know, for example, what is the design effect for these indicators, and that would also inform uh, sample size calculation and looking what sample sizes people are achieving for IYCF indicators in smart surveys to then could kind of give some guidance basically and could kind of understand better because you know if we're having only 30 children or 40 children of a specific indicator that may not be sufficient and and sometimes uh you know for anthropometry indicators 
it's a standard a smart output that we automatically give the confidence intervals. But for IYCF indicators, I've seen reports where they just give the prevalence without confidence intervals. And, and if uh, obviously these prevalences are only based on 30, 40 children, you know, these, these uh, you know, uh, prevalences may have very wide confidence intervals to the point that they are unstable and maybe a little bit misleading. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oli, for those um, um, intriguing points. I take your point about uh, the importance of uh, standardizing the questions, uh, the translations to maintain the meaning, and then sufficient time uh, spent on training. I will pass it on to Larry for his uh, contributions to this as well. Larry, over to you, please. Thank you, Fatima. Um, so to the specific question here, what we're, we're doing on um, the adaptation in emergency and fragile context, um, this isn't really an area that WHO is working on actively right now. Um, there are activities that are related in, in various ways that I think will contribute to this, um, but nothing that is, is so specific. Um, we are working on guidelines for the both prevention and treatment of wasting. Um, so it's not for the general population of, of an emergency setting, but clearly for those children who, uh, who do slip into um, moderate or severe acute malnutrition, um, we'll have further guidance on the feeding. Um, and that may have some implications then about this prioritization, what kinds of indicators would we really want to, to focus more attention on um, in that context. Um, more generally about the, the guidelines and the uh, kind of the, the, the application and standardization, uh, we're certainly working more on dissemination uh, of the, the, the manual. There are many that you know, have heard, heard about it, but don't know much about it. Um, and taking a, a 200 page document and making it accessible um, are some of the things that we're working on. There is a WHO UNICEF um, team, we call it T-E-A-M, that looks at a number of monitoring issues and recommendations for surveys. And a subgroup of that is really Really focusing in on the IYCF indicators to, to get them out more widely used and answer questions about them. We're certainly involved in Q&A. Um, many people re reach out to us with specific questions about, well, what, what about, what should I do in my context for, for this indicator? How do I measure this differently? What, what can I do here to adapt this? Um, and so I'm trying, trying to address that. And I think that that will probably lead us to a little bit more of a QA. and a uh, We're not ready to write that today, but as we keep hearing these questions coming in uh, frequently, uh, we'll, we'll try and get better guidance out to that. We're also working on translation of the questionnaire into the six, WH, six UN languages. Um, and uh, I mentioned this meeting that we had yesterday uh, was with DHS, um, and that was about cognitive testing of the questionnaire um, and ways that the questions work well. And we, we just got some results back on that. So we're, we're looking at, are there some adaptations that might need to be made to the, the way the questionnaire is done, um, or at least in how it's applied in different contexts based on how, how some questions worked well and some questions were a little bit more complicated for the respondents to answer. Um, so it's more, much more focused on uh, application uh, of the existing guidance across the board rather than specific to emergencies, but hopefully it would be relevant guidance there as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. I think those are really important uh, activities to help in the further adaptation of the um, indicators, including the dis further dissemination of the manual, the Q&A, and the translation into different languages. Thank you so much. That will be so helpful. Uh, Brenda, over to you, please. Thanks. So just adding on to Larry has given a very comprehensive overview of the different dissemination activities planned for this guidance. Uh, but I think additionally, with this guidance on practice indicators, there are other ways with which we can supplement information specifically in the emergency context. On, on this front, UNICEF is leading the development of a standardized set of indicators to be collected in emergencies through DHIS2, the Routine Health Information Systems, where we have had a round of consultations with global stakeholders that includes WHO, GNC, IFE, some of the members and partners have been part of those discussions. And uh, we actually just had a call yesterday 
And it seems from the partners reporting tool, few additional IYCF indicators are going to be recommended into the DSGIS2 emergency module. And we would be sharing that updated guidance as and when it becomes ready. But also at this point in time, we are compiling a list of topic areas which, have, which would be pilot tested for DHIS2. And as we collect these areas, we can see what more needs to be done in terms of monitoring this specifically in the context of emergencies. Over. Excellent, Rinda. Those are really important additions. Thank you so much. Um, we look forward to the development of um, the standardized set of in uh, indicators through DHIS2 for emergencies and comp uh, compilation of the list of topic areas and sharing with um, relevant uh, uh, stakeholders and partners. Thank you so much. I will hand back over to Linda and Hassan for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatmata, and thanks to the panelists uh, for, for your very, very inform um, sort of informative feedback and, and contributions to, to these discussions. Um, we have received quite a number of um, questions, very interesting questions uh, from a very large group of people. Uh, we may not be able to answer all the questions or address all the questions uh, during this webinar, but um, I want to reassure everyone that we will record all the questions and will hopefully provide a written response um, on the uh, Global Mission Cluster Technical Alliance website and uh, uh, as well as the Global Mission Cluster website. So. I'm just going to pick a sample of these questions and um, address them to our panelists uh, for, for feedback. So maybe starting with Brinda, one of our colleagues is asking um, that they understand that selection of indicators are based on how relevant they are in the, in the context, uh, but do we have a minimum number of indicators that should be done in any survey? Uh, thanks. It again comes down to prioritization. In our guidance, we feel that all the 17 recommended indicators are actually important and more so because it does not require additional effort in terms of data collection. But like we said, if in a country or in an emergency context, undernutrition is a problem and not overnutrition, one may think about dropping the unhealthy eating practices. Similarly, when it comes to exclusive breastfeeding for children under six months, one really does not have to go through a very extensive list of foods because we know at that age, you don't need to have all of the different information about the various food groups, but there may be a way to just ask a simplified food group or just simply ask, did they have any solid, semi-solid food yesterday? So there are ways to still collect that information, but it comes back to something we were saying initially in that anytime these adaptations are made, there is a risk of losing comparability with the standard recommended indicators. But again, it all boils down to what the program within that context is trying to change, what behaviors they are specifically targeting. So if complementary feeding is not really a target practice that you are trying to change, then you don't have to ask all of those questions. And you can just be focused on the breastfeeding questions for that. Thank you very much for that, Brenda. I don't know if uh, Larry or Dr. Oleg have any additional input to that question. I don't at this point. Great, thanks. Dr. Oleg? You unmute, sorry. I think it should definitely be context specific and, uh, and we have to realize that by assessing, for example, one indicator, we're also answering a number of other indicators. For example, assessing food frequency, uh, we're already assessing these other indicators like egg and meat 
and vegetables, etc. So, uh, so I don't believe there is a minimum set of indicators. It should be context specific. And I know that often people just kind of put in the whole questionnaire and they, uh, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, and the next question, I will address it to Larry. Um, so one of our colleagues is asking for a suggestion on how to incorporate uh, these indicators, these RICF indicators into routine health information systems of, the, of ministries of health. It's a very challenging question. Um, it, it, they weren't really designed for that purpose. They're, they're very much designed for a questionnaire, um, a household questionnaire. Um, and the expectation is that you have the time where you can go through a, a, a structured set of questions uh, with, with a mother. Most clinical settings don't lend themselves toward, toward that um, level of detail. Doesn't mean that it's impossible, um, but oftentimes cl clinical staff really need to be focusing their attention on, on the clinical services, not on uh, collecting data. Um, in a numerate population, I think this could certainly be done, uh, or a, a very literate population, this could be done with a, a written questionnaire while people are maybe sitting in the waiting room or, or in waiting lines. Um, but for settings where there's a significant illiteracy, I don't think that that's at all feasible. Um, so you really do have to have the personnel associated with it. Um, so I really think that you know, in, in a clinical setting, you need to take a very different approach um, it probably needs to, to go at a, a much smaller set uh, of these, not trying to collect all of the data, um, but to focus in on some specific behaviors. Um, if you're looking at um, using, it, using that as a setting just to collect data, um, some of the, the retrospective data questions might be the easiest to ask. Uh, did, when did you start breastfeeding? Was it exclusive in the first two days? Not, not asked that way, but ask the, ask the correct questions. But th those are quite appropriate to a clinical setting. Um, but they're not necessarily so timely um, because it might be reflecting for, for a child you know, born many months ago. Um, on the other hand, for the clinical practice of, of treating this child, it's going to be very much dependent on the age of that child. So for a child who is three months of age, you're very much going to focus in on just those questions about what is this child con consuming at this time? You're not gonna do much probing on complementary foods. You might just say, is there anything, any solid foods being given at that point? Um, and that's good enough. So you can boil this down to a much smaller set of questions. Um, on the other hand, for a 22 month old, you might be very focused on uh, is the child consuming enough uh, meals a day? And what is the, uh, what is the overall consumption look like? Um, so I think in that context, you're probably going to have to go to a much smaller set of questions and be much more focused uh, depending on the age of the child. Thank you very much, Larry, for, for that answer. Um, Brinda, do you have anything to add to that point? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Larry just said, that these indicators are not really meant for being collected in routine health systems. And I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the findings from our DHIS2 global consultation, where we had country partners. And at that consultation, there was an agreement that IYCF practice indicators, as mentioned in this updated guidance document, should not really be collected through these routine systems because of the challenges that Larry just mentioned, other than early initiation of breastfeeding. So the DHIS2 guidance document that would be coming up next year, you would see that we are proposing to collect early initiation of breastfeeding, perhaps through routine health systems. Systems. But other than that, it really focuses on getting information on IYCF counseling and not really any other practice indicators. Over. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, the next question is related to sample size um, and sample size calculations. And I'm going to ask Dr. Oleg to uh, respond to this and maybe just at the same time have the opportunity to maybe get your input or feedback on the earlier question on sampling and sample size calculation. So one of our colleagues is asking, does, um, do you think barrier analysis, uh, I think, I believe this is a method for IYCF that has a sample of about 45 doers versus 
45 non-doers uh, can be considered as statistical um, and um, representative and, and useful for decision making. I am not familiar with this method. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with kind of, you know, with the barrier analysis where you have doers and non-doers. Right, but maybe just to speak a bit more on the sampling and sample size calculation for IYCF indicators. Um, mm -hmm. could... uh, obviously, in smart surveys, we do not calculate sample size based on on IYCF indicators. We calculate sample size based on the anthropometry indicators. So, uh, if you include IYCF questions into a smart survey you will have to live with the sample size that you get from that. Uh, obviously, uh, let's say most of, the, of these new IYCF indicators are either for six to 23 months age window or zero to 23 age window. So let's say that we have a smart survey of approximately 600 people 600 children under five years of age. Uh, of them, probably approximately like one third will be will be children, uh, roughly, uh, you know, in that age group under two years of age. So, so I think with like 200, 250 children should be sufficient to achieve sensible. Uh, uh, you know, confidence interval. But again, I think we need more data sets to actually look at how many children are found in different smart surveys, uh, like you know, how many children we get for different indicators, you know, what, what confidence intervals we are getting, uh, what design effect is, you know, that's kind of a really interesting question for us. So short answer, uh, I, in smart surveys, you get uh, what you get from the anthropometry indicator, sample size calculation. You don't calculate sample size based on IYCF indicators. If you do a separate IYCF survey, then obviously your sampling will be different. And since it's difficult to find children under two years of age, you need to go to more households. As Larry, I believe mentioned before, it's a little bit more work. So if there are registries for, especially in refugee camps where UNHCR is now doing an excellent job and everybody is registered and kind of at least in the orderly refugee settings, they know where these children live and kind of, you know, they can be found. It's, it's really much easier to use the registration data and just say, okay, we only look at the households where we know these children under two should be, and we are only going to sample from these households. And, and we have the registry, and then we'll know the addresses, and we will go to those addresses instead of, kind of going door to door to door to door, and, and only maybe one of five or one of ten households will have these children. Over. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Oleg, uh, for that feedback. If I could just add one comment to that, um, I agree 100% with Oleg that rarely do you make the, the sample size calculations on the basis of the IYCF indicators. I mean, unless you're doing a targeted survey just for that purpose, which is, is generally pretty rare. Um, so you're pretty much kind of left with the sample size that you get. Someone else has made a decision for the general purpose of the survey. It's based on other calculations. Um, but I think what's relevant for, for IYCF is to decide, is it even worth it then to include these questions? If the sample size is going to be so small that you're going to have huge confidence intervals and it's meaningless for you, then why did you waste the time to, to get you know, a, a number plus or minus 40%? You know, that, that's just not helpful. And so I think that it is valuable to, to rather than take the IYCF questions and build a sample size, is to take the sample size and say, what will the implications of that be for my confidence intervals? And then you need to decide, are those confidence intervals reasonable for my purpose? If my purpose is just to generally understand the population that I'm working in, it might be perfectly fine to have a fairly wide confidence interval. It may not matter if exclusive breastfeeding is 
30% or 55%, you know you're somewhere in the middle there. Um, on the other hand, if you're trying to use that for trend purposes and you want to say, is it going up or is it going down, being in the range of 30 to 55% is, is not helpful. You're not going to be able to do anything with that information. So why collect the data and then not be able to make to try any conclusions from it? Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, addition, Larry. And maybe just uh, staying with you, Larry, on, on the next question. Um, so can we compare nutritional outcomes to changes uh, in dietary diversity? I assume by that they mean nutritional outcomes in terms of wasting, stunting, um, overweight, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, is that some kind of a, a biological characteristic. Um, very difficult to do so. Uh, there, this has been done in some large surveys and you do see some correlations. Um, the, the fact is um, that the indicators that we have are point in time indicators whereas the uh, nutritional outcomes are generally a reflection of a long period of time. Uh, and so what a person's diet was yesterday um, is not a good, good determinant of what has happened to this person over the last six months, 12 months, two years. Um, and so, it, so it, it's very messy. And there are also many other indicators going on there in terms of care practices, infections, and many other determinants to consider as well. Um, so I would discourage that kind of analysis. I think you know, there are ways that it can be done in very sophisticated studies uh, to try to tease some of that out, um, but certainly it's not a direction that I would try to be going in emergencies. Thank you very much for that. Um, so just a final question maybe to Brenda. Um, one of our colleagues is asking, so in case of emergencies or in emergency context, how are these indicators adapted to uh, populations like uh, pastoralist and agro-pastoralist uh, populations? Sorry, could you repeat that question? So in, in case of emergencies, um, how are these IYCF indicators adapted to um, population groups like pastoralists and agro-pastoralists? Um, like we said, we haven't done adaptations per se. We haven't really worked on adaptations within emergency contexts or specific population groups. But in general, these are the recommended feeding practices. This is how children in the first two years of life should be fed. So in general, it should apply to whatever type of population groups you are looking at. But uh, yeah, there, like we have been saying, there hasn't been more detailed work into how for different population groups, some of these indicators or collection methodologies may be adapted. Oh, well. Great, thank you very much, Brenda, for that. Um, so we're going to stop here for the questions now, um, but for those questions that were not answered, we will make all efforts to provide a written response. And um, as I said earlier, they will be posted together with the recording of this webinar on the Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance website. So we're coming to the end of our very interesting and very informative uh, webinar. Uh, I want to appreciate again the panelists, uh, Dr. Oleg, Larry, Brenda, for your time and, and your valuable contributions. Um, so next slide. So we have a, a webinar uh, sort of evaluation. Uh, please feel free to provide us your feedback, your input on how this webinar was conducted. It, it would be very useful for us to uh, see how we can improve and be better for the next webinars uh, or some of the things that actually worked well that can be replicated for, for the next webinars. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, as usual, if you're looking for support on um, in nutrition in emergencies, um, there are a number of avenues that you can ask and receive this support. Um, 
there is a global nutrition cluster technical alliance that can provide and is always available to provide remote uh, or in-country technical support. Um, there is also the global nutrition cluster technical alliance consultant roster where you can apply to be a consultant uh, or you can also request for consultants through this roster. Um, you can also get technical advice through the Global Nutrition Cluster Help Desk. Uh, and this is uh, a support that's available all throughout uh, any day, any time. And uh, of course, through the ENNet uh, platform, you can get um, peer support and engage with your peers on technical matters. Uh, for more of this information, you can visit the Nutrition Cluster website, um, and you can um, click on the request for support. And that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, I'm going to hand over to Linda to do the sort of final closing remark. Thank you so much, um, Hassan. I join you also uh, to uh, really appreciate our uh, really the precious time from our panelists. Uh, this has been a really interesting discussion, and I'm I'm sure that more will receive more questions and more discussions. And I'm looking forward to uh, working together uh, within the IFP core group and the NIS and uh, partners. Um, on improving IYCFE, specifically indicators, a lot to do. Um, so hopefully that will be for next year. I take this uh, opportunity to thank the translators and uh, colleagues behind the scene from GNCTA uh, for their uh, continuous support and uh, wish you a great rest of the day wherever you are joining us from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. -bye. you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.